Nicole Vanderheiden was a mother of three who had a lot of potential and a lot of life ahead of her. With a six-month-old infant at home, Nikki and her boyfriend Doug scheduled a much-needed night out. Any way you cut it, parenting an infant is difficult. But when the drinks started flowing, the uglier side of the couple's relationship clearly revealed itself. Rather than having a relaxing night out, the couple's evening spiraled into a heated argument with one of the two storming off into the night, never to be seen again. Nicole Vanderheiden, or Nikki as her friends called her, was a mother of three. She had two children from a previous marriage that had unfortunately ended in divorce. She and her ex-husband shared custody of the children, and by all accounts, they had a pretty good co-parenting situation. Nikki and her kids lived alongside her boyfriend, Doug Detree. The two had met, started dating, and moved in together within a matter of months. It all happened shockingly fast. It wasn't long afterward that Nikki became pregnant with their first child, Dylan. Of course, the pregnancy was sudden, but they were excited about it and were ready to take the next step in their relationship together. Shared parenthood. Nikki worked as a substitute teacher for the Green Bay Area Public School District. In particular, she loved teaching science. She had a passion for teaching kids about nature and exploring the great outdoors with them, helping future generations learn what it feels like to touch grass instead of glass. From the outside, it seemed like Nikki was an upstanding, all-American woman with no secrets to hide and the perfect relationship. To everyone around her, it probably appeared like she was living the dream. But looks aren't always what they seem. See, Doug and Nikki had been experiencing some turbulence in their relationship. If you think about it, Nikki and Doug hadn't been together long before she got pregnant, and she brought two children from her previous marriage, whom she shared custody with. That means that not only were there three kids involved, but her ex was around too. A lot. None of that's a bad thing on Nikki's part, but Doug just wasn't sure he was ready for it all. In fact, he wasn't even sure that the family life was even for him, though he probably should have thought about that before the whole pregnancy thing. Nikki was also guilty of frequently accusing Doug of wanting to get with other women, but it seems like her accusations had a bit of truth to them. Doug did truly miss the single life, and because of his soul-searching and trying to figure out what he wanted, Nicole had started to feel like she'd been left on the back burner. When you combine all of these complicating factors into the lives of these two, you can't help but feel like it's a recipe for disaster. And in due time, that would turn out to be true. On the night of May 20th, 2016, Nikki and Doug went to a Steel Panther concert at a local bar called The Watering Hole. The two had been urged to go out by Doug's friend, Greg, probably because he noticed how worn down the two had been acting lately, what with their newfound lifestyle surrounded by deeply opinionated kids. The two had arranged for Nikki's mother to come stay with Dylan for part of the night, while Nikki's friend Dallas Kennedy stayed with him for the rest of the evening until Doug returned home. Nikki's other two children were with their father for the weekend. Nikki, Doug, and their group of friends had fun at the concert. The watering hole is quite large, and hundreds of people were packed into the establishment, so it was a pretty lively concert. What's interesting is that everybody in attendance that night says that Nikki was really pounding the drinks back and quickly. Nikki had also been breastfeeding for months, so she didn't really have a tolerance built up to handle the massive volume of alcohol that she was ingesting. And because of that, things quickly got out of hand. After the concert, Doug bumped into some old friends from high school, and they asked if he'd like to have a drink with them. Nikki and the original friend group had planned to head to a second bar called the Sardine Can. Doug told them to go ahead and go to the next bar, and he would meet up with them later, saying that he wanted to catch up with his old friends for a while. Nicole was pretty upset about this. After all, they were out that night with his friends, not hers. She was already annoyed when he essentially blew her off for his old high school friends, but then she started feeling as though he may have been chatting up other women who were there that night as well, and that's when Nikki got very upset. When the two were separated, she began drunkenly texting him, accusing him of all sorts of things, calling him a cheater, an abuser, and everything in between. Doug, on the other hand, wasn't taking her accusations seriously, which probably just made things worse. From his texts, it's hard to tell if he was trying to de-escalate things or if he was just 
flat out blowing her off and dismissing her concerns, but whatever the case was, Nikki was fuming. Somewhere around 12.30 a.m., Nikki called Doug, but he didn't answer her call. She then had a friend call him, and he answered that call. That upset Nikki even more. Surveillance footage from the sardine can showed Nikki and her friends were there from about 11.15 p.m. until about 11.45 p.m. Police say that it was clear to see that Nikki was on her phone and very upset. After a while, she stood up and stormed off with her friend Aaron Glinsky in tow. According to Aaron, Nikki was having fun and letting loose, but then Doug quit replying to her texts, and that made her upset, and he said she walked out of the bar angrily. He said he was trying to either get her to come back to the bar or call her a taxi to get her home, but that caused an argument between the two. She started getting physical with him, so he walked off and just let her do her thing. Surveillance footage from the bar proved that Aaron was telling the truth. Shortly after Nikki stormed off, Aaron and the rest of the group got an Uber and went home. Doug and his group of friends wouldn't arrive at the sardine can until about 12.18 a.m., about 30 minutes after Nikki and the other group had already left. But according to surveillance footage, it doesn't look like Doug was even there for Nikki. It kind of looks like he couldn't have cared less where she'd gotten off to. He and his new group of friends stayed at the bar until about 2.15 a.m. before calling it a night. After Nikki had left, she continued drunk texting Doug, and eventually her phone died. But he did get one last text from her, explaining that she'd met a friend, but she never explained who this friend was or where she'd met this person. Doug assumed that he'd meet up with Nikki when he got home a short while later, but when he showed up at 3 a.m., Nikki was nowhere to be found. Nikki's friend, the one who'd been babysitting their infant, was a bit worried when Nikki never came back home, but they both just assumed she'd lost track of time and would show up later on, but she never did. The next morning, when Doug woke up at around 11 a.m., Nikki still hadn't returned home. Doug texted Greg, Dallas, and Nikki's sister, Heather, in an attempt to see if any of them had seen her, but they hadn't. Doug texted Nikki all throughout that morning and early evening, but all of these texts remained unread and it was around that time that everyone realized something had gone horribly wrong. On May 21st, 2016, a 911 call came in from a farmer. He was frantic and said that he just stumbled across a crime scene. Uh, we just found a human body laying in Okay, weeds. okay. Oh God. Is the person beyond help, or do I need to give yeah. instructions for CPR? No, it's okay. beyond help. The scene he'd found was in a wooded area in a field just far enough that it wasn't immediately visible from the road. It was located in Bellevue, which is in the Green Bay area. A blonde woman was lying face down in the dirt. Investigators found that she was only wearing her socks and two pink wristbands from the bars she'd attended the night before. And there was what appeared to be a shoe print on her back. It takes quite a bit of force to stomp someone in the back so hard that a shoe print remains on bare skin but that was only a small taste of the violence that this woman had suffered. Sergeant Richard Lopnow with the Brown County Sheriff Department said, quote, the extent of the injuries that she suffered were pretty horrific. There was trauma to her neck in addition to lacerations and bruising throughout her body. Her fingernails were damaged, indicative of defensive wounds. This tells us she was fighting for her life. Nicole's body wasn't immediately identifiable because of all the excessive bruising. She was instead identified through dental records, and they confirmed this was Nicole. She sustained more than 240 individual injuries. According to the medical examiner, Nikki had 20 abrasions, 8 lacerations, 8 contusions, a fractured skull, a hemorrhaged tongue, and bleeding around the brain. Most of the injuries occurred before Nicole's passing, although some occurred after. There were so many injuries that it was difficult to tell when some of them had even taken place. There was also some indication that she'd been assaulted, but this wasn't immediately confirmed. Not long after Nikki's body was identified, some bloody clothing was discovered on the side of the road around a mile from the crime scene. It was quickly determined to be Nikki's. A thorough search of the area revealed her purse with her ID and cell phone inside, as well as her shoes. The police turned the evidence over to the crime lab for analysis, but Unfortunately, due to a ton of other submissions, the lab was only accepting 10 submissions at a time, meaning they'd have to wait quite a bit of time before all of Nikki's evidence could be processed. Police were baffled. Not only did they not know what happened to Nicole, 
but now they had to deal with backlogs slowing down important breaks in the case. When Nikki's case made the headlines, the Green Bay community was understandably shaken. Residents never thought such a horrific crime could happen in their sleepy little town. No one could imagine who could have done this to Nikki, a loving mother and a great friend. But even though investigators didn't have a definitive suspect, they definitely had a hunch. During the initial stages of the investigation, police were suspicious of Nicole's boyfriend, Doug. While police were still at the scene of Nicole's body, they received another 911 call around 4.30 p.m., and they quickly determined this call had come from Doug. He called in to report that he hadn't seen Nicole since the night before. Police were quick to follow up with him and headed to the couple's home, and one officer noted that Doug appeared to be hungover. Doug told the officer about what had unfolded the night before, and how Nikki never came home. He hoped she'd showed up the following morning, but when she didn't, he decided to call in a missing person report. One of the officers reported that there were inconsistencies with Doug's level of concern for Nikki, but I'm not 100% sure what he meant by this. I'm assuming he means that it seemed as though he was faking his worry for Nikki, but that may not be completely accurate. The police definitely had questions for Doug when he placed his missing person report. For instance, why did it take him so long? Their infant son needed his mom, especially since he was still breastfeeding. Though admittedly, Nikki certainly shouldn't have been breastfeeding the morning after a night like they had. The same night that Doug filed the missing person report, a warrant to search the home was executed. At the same time, Doug was brought in for a three-hour interrogation by detectives Brian Slinger and Lee Kingston. When asked why he waited so long to make the report, Doug said that he wasn't feeling good and thought that Nikki ran off with some other guy. He basically said that he just didn't want to deal with all of that, so he just let it slide. Around two hours into the interrogation, detectives finally broke the news to Doug about the body that had been found in the field. They carefully monitored his reaction to the news, then asked him if he had anything to do with her disappearance. He insisted that he didn't, and even began to sob, saying, I want her back. She needs to come back. Just a short while later, a big break in the case came when two joggers made a report. They'd noticed a pool of blood on a nearby street curb, then a neighbor found a cord when they accidentally hit it with a lawnmower. It turned out to be an Android cell phone charging cord. When officers showed up to the scene of these two discoveries, they searched a nearby lawn and found clumps of blonde hair. All of this evidence was collected a very short distance from Nikki and Doug's home. And when everything was sent in for forensic testing, it was found that it all belonged to Nikki. That's when the police arrested Doug. The theory that cops had at the time was that maybe Nikki had gotten home, had another argument with Doug, then the two had gotten into an altercation in the street or the driveway. Then once the deed was done, he used Nikki's car to transport her body to a field. Nikki's back had a lot of shoe prints on it. They had a distinct herringbone tread pattern, which is present on some Air Jordan and other athletic shoes that were popular at the time. Detectives found a similar pair of shoes in Doug's house. Suspiciously, they had red drops on the bottom and some red staining. Doug also didn't have a rock-solid alibi. But that's also where the evidence against Doug stopped making sense. Surveillance found that Doug left his car at the watering hole that evening. Data from Nikki's car revealed that it hadn't been driven on the night of her passing either. Even though police were suspicious of him, forensics didn't reveal any of Doug's DNA anywhere on Nikki's body. They did find male DNA, but it didn't belong to Doug. When detectives found traces of blood in Doug's garage, they thought they had finally pinned him. But then they found out that this blood wasn't even human. It had come from a turkey. There was blood found in Nikki's car but this was confirmed to have come from an injury one of her children had recently sustained. Greg was questioned by the police too. Greg, if you remember, is Doug's friend who'd initially invited Nikki and Doug to the watering hole that evening. Greg wasn't exactly forthcoming with information. When they asked Greg for someone who could vouch for where he was during the 60 minutes after he left the bar, but before Doug relieved the babysitter, he literally just got up and left the room, just walked out. But his story and timeline matched Doug's. And when police retrieved location data from both of their phones, it backed up their claims. Police didn't have anything concrete against Doug or Greg at this point, but things kept looking worse for Doug. 
Not only were the cops suspicious of him because he didn't seem to have actually looked very hard for his girlfriend after their argument, but her family also accused him of being abusive. Nikki's sister, Heather, said that Doug not only drank heavily, but also used illegal substances. Nikki had also recently admitted to her mother that Doug had been physical with her in the past. Then Doug's ex, Rebecca Mott, told detectives that he could sometimes be both jealous and violent, saying that he'd broken her ankle once and would repeatedly throw things. Sixteen days after his arrest, Doug was released, simply due to a lack of evidence. The case against Doug was quickly unraveling as they couldn't find any solid evidence that directly tied Doug to the scene of the crime. In fact, at the end of it all, they were able to definitively clear Doug using a bit of technology. Detective Slinger said, quote, We went back and looked at the videos, and we'd noticed that Doug was wearing his Fitbit the day that we interviewed him at the house, when he called in the missing person report. We started to think about, can we get the data off that Fitbit? Was he moving around that night? When the Fitbit was brought in for analysis, it was confirmed that Doug wasn't moving around at the time that Nikki had lost her life, proving he couldn't have been involved, after learning of the violent nature in which Nikki met her end. As far as his Fitbit was concerned, Doug was immobile from the moment he got home to the moment he woke up, aside from a small amount of activity that would have been consistent with the trip to the restroom. This evidence cleared Doug because he couldn't have gotten up, committed the crime, drove a few miles out, disposed of the body, and then drove back home while only recording a few steps on the Fitbit. It simply wasn't possible. Doug was not their guy. But if Doug didn't do it, who did? It took another two months before investigators received another break in the case. They were able to pull DNA from Nicole's socks, of all things. When running the DNA through their database, they got a hit from a Virginia man named George Birch. Now, you're probably wondering how DNA from a man in Virginia was discovered on a body in Wisconsin. Well, George had actually been living in Green Bay for about three months, and George was a really problematic individual. Everybody called him Big Country because of his massive 6'8 frame. In 1998, he'd been tried for the homicide of a gang leader in Virginia named Joey White. Apparently, George had been assaulted by Joey and some of his crew two different times. This resulted in a big fight, and Joey lost his life by the end of it all. George was found not guilty. That same year, George was charged with burglary. He was actually kept in police custody so that the gang wouldn't retaliate against him for Joey's passing during this time. He also had a felony firearm charge. This man was bad news all the way around. From there, he moved to New York with his wife and their two kids to start over and hit the refresh button. But eventually that marriage ended and he felt the need to move yet again. He moved in with his friends Edward and Linda Jackson in Green Bay, Wisconsin. The Jacksons described him as being a quiet, charming, and personable man. He was an all-around likable guy in his new atmosphere. He'd become a regular at a bar three blocks away called Richard Craniums, and he had a girlfriend who was 18 years younger than him. And although this was a little odd, everything seemed to be going all right for George. The Jacksons were completely taken aback by George's arrest for the violent crimes against Nicole Vanderheiden. They had no idea. In fact, Ed and George actually went on a fishing trip that day that Nicole's crime scene was discovered. Detectives paid George a visit, and while questioning him about the evening that Nikki lost her life, they asked George if they could take a look at his phone. George handed over his phone, and investigators were able to clone it. Detective Slinger said, quote, It basically mapped out that night and gave us all of the answers we needed to have. Google location data revealed that George was at Richard Cranium's into the early morning hours of that night. After that, he was outside Nicole and Doug's house from 3 a.m. to 3.15 a.m. He was at the farm where Nicole's body was discovered at 4 a.m., and the location further down the road where her clothes were found at 4.05 a.m. Then he went home. This man was everywhere investigators suspected him to be, at precisely the exact times when they suspected of him being there. On September 7th, George was brought in for questioning, but he refused to talk, so he was immediately arrested. His trial started in 2018, and he definitely had an interesting story to tell the jury. George claimed that he met Nikki at a bar. They started flirting with each other, and things got hot and heavy between them. He made the claim that they had relations inside his car, outside Nikki's house. But then he said that someone came over to the car, 
and hit him in the head with something, which knocked him unconscious. He continued, saying, quote, The next thing I remember was literally waking up on the ground outside the truck. He said that he saw Nikki was no longer alive. At this point, he says that Doug held him at gunpoint, forcing him to drive him to various locations and assist him with disposing of Nikki's body. Once he disposed of the body, he says he pushed Doug down a ravine and sped off, tossing Nikki's belongings out along the way. Now, this story may just sound totally ridiculous, and it is, but the police did look into it just in case there was a bit of truth to it. There wasn't. According to investigators, what they believe took place makes a lot more sense. They believe that Nikki ended up at the same bar as George that night, and the two struck up a conversation. After the evening had ended, George offered to take Nikki home, believing he was going to be, well, rewarded for making sure she got home safely. Nikki, on the other hand, had no such intentions. This caused George to become incredibly angry, at which point the assault on Nikki unfolded, leading to all the awful and gruesome injuries Nikki was left with that night. Officers say that at some point during the ordeal, Nikki fell out of the vehicle and George continued to stomp on her, eventually ending her life. Now, George's defense team did dig up a little bit of dirt on Doug, Nikki's boyfriend but all they were able to confirm was that Doug was having second thoughts about being a father, and he didn't believe he was cut out for the job. Depending on how you read these messages, Doug may have planned on ditching Nikki and leaving her to fend for herself and the children, but we'll never know as things never got that far. All we can say for certain is that Doug was just terrified. In the end, the jury took only three hours to come back with a verdict for George. Guilty. The judge had a lot to say about this case saying, quote, you drop the body off in a field, and then 12 hours later, go on a boat and be smiling like nothing happened. Like you didn't have a care in the world. How can we explain that? That isn't human. That isn't normal in Wisconsin. This is the most brutal case that has ever been committed by one person in the history of Brown County. That's how severe this case is. This is a crime that would, I believe, merit the death penalty, and for that reason, you have to die in prison, end quote. George was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And when it comes to cases like this, with so many twists and turns, it can be easy to lose sight of what matters, and that's the victim, Nicole. According to everyone who knew her, Nicole Vanderheiden was a good teacher with a drive and passion for teaching young children. And she was an exceptional mother who wanted nothing but the best for her kids. What was supposed to be a relaxing night out for Nicole and her boyfriend well, it turned into something much more than she anticipated. Not only did she feel betrayed by Doug, but in the end, she was betrayed by a complete stranger, all because she wanted a ride back home after an already terrible evening. Now, I didn't know Nicole, so I can't vouch for her on a personal level, but considering what her friends and family had to say about her, I can't help but imagine that Nicole was just a young mother trying to figure out what she was gonna do with her life and who she was going to spend it with and she was desperately trying to hold together the relationships with the fathers of her children. She probably made a few mistakes along the way. Doug was happy to put all of that out there. But that doesn't mean she deserved this. No one deserves this. If there's anything to be learned from her story, never, ever abandon the people you love. It doesn't matter if you're just wanting to hang out with your bros from high school for a little while. It doesn't matter how mad you may be at your spouse or significant other. When you're both in the vulnerable position of being out in public among strangers drinking, look out for one another. Don't just walk off and leave someone after some stupid argument. This whole situation could have been prevented in so many different ways, but the fact of the matter is, it wasn't. And Nicole paid the ultimate price. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered. And don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.